Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sal Gilberto from Awareness, and today is um, Thursday, March 24th, and we are here with uh, with your uh, awareness webinar entitled "What No One Is Telling You About Your Content Strategy." I'm here with Jason Falls. Hi, Jason. Hey, Sal. How are you? Good. Good. Um, and we will be presenting our presentation for the last uh, little, you know, around an hour or so. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to go over a couple of housekeeping items before we start with the presentation. But um, let's just talk about our presenters. Uh, I know it says that I'm Mike Lewis, but that's not the case. Sorry to disappoint everybody, but uh, he had to step out, so I'm taking his place. But um, you will be hearing from Jason Falls from um, he's got for sort of two areas. SocialMediaExplorer.com, which is a you know social media marketing industry blog, consistently uh, in the top 15 of the Ad Age Power 150. Um, he's also uh, in charge of exploring social media. Excuse me, in charge of the exploring social media online learning community, a subscription-based membership community for people who want to get smart about social media. Um, just want to let you know that as we go, any questions that you may have can be submitted in, in two ways. The first way is via Twitter. So um, if you have any questions, you can submit them via Twitter with the uh, hashtag um, Pound Awareness Inc. You can also submit questions via the WebEx Q&A, and um, you're going to want to send those to all panelists when you do send those. Um, just to let you know, we do have WebEx support on the line. So um, you can submit your questions about, obviously, the content of our presentation, but if you run into any technical problems, you can also submit them via the WebEx Q&A. We do have someone from WebEx on the line to help you out. Uh, just to let you know, what we're going to do is we're going to go through, uh, Jason's going to go through his presentation, and we are going to save questions till the end. I'll, uh, you know, we'll try to answer as time as we go, but um, we'll be addressing the questions that came in via Twitter and the Q&A. At the end of the presentation, we leave a lot of time for that. So um, before we get started with the presentation, really quickly, I just want to go over who awareness is. Many of you on the line have been to these webinars before. Some of you are brand new, but... Um, Awareness is um, awareness is a company that makes uh, software for marketers. That's all we do. Um, that's that's you know our 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 only products are software tools for marketers. Specifically, we make what's called the social marketing hub, which is a uh, it's a product that allows you to publish, manage, measure, and engage across social media channels. As you can see from the slide, we work with some of the largest brands in the world, as you can see from the lower left. Um, and we partner with some of the largest agencies in the world, as you can see from the lower right. Um, but that, uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have uh, tools and software offerings for both small and medium-sized businesses. So, you know, being a social marketing uh, company, a company that makes tools for marketers, we notice that there's a couple of social marketing challenges that sort of commonly come up when we talk to customers. Um, the first one is that they feel overwhelmed, that social media is only a percentage of their job, uh, but it requires time sort of beyond that percentage to do effectively. Um, they, social marketers have problems proving the value. Um, they know that social marketing, social media has value, but um, they don't really have sort of a buy-in from executives, buy-in from colleagues. Uh, they don't have hard and fast facts to show their worth. They feel like they're losing control. Um, they feel like their uh, marketers feel like there's lots of channels to be in, each channel requires a certain amount of publishing. Each channel requires a certain amount of, um, of commenting back. Um, but there's lots of passwords that are, spread around, that are sent around via spreadsheets or different access problems. Um, and they just, in general, don't feel like they have control over social media the same way they do over something like you know, email marketing or something like that. And if you feel overwhelmed and you can't prove the value and you feel like you're losing control, you really feel like you can't get strategic. If, uh, we don't hear, or we hear uh, a lot of companies complain that, you know, they can't get strategic in the way that they can with other initiatives where they set quarterly goals and have budgets for social media, and then they reevaluate at the end of the quarter whether they sort of met those goals or not. So with that in mind, um, we created the Social Marketing Hub, which is a, it's a web-based tool that allows marketers to publish, manage, measure, and engage across social media channels. And uh, when we say across social media channels, we really do mean, you know, the most important social media channels. You have Facebook, Foursquare, Twitter, Flickr, SlideShare, WordPress, YouTube. Um, and as other, um, as other channels pop up, we address those as well. So that's really what the Social Marketing Hub does. So, you know, the Social Marketing Hub, um, it allows you to publish across social media channels 
all from one place, all from a centralized location. So it allows you to manage your publishing, manage your social media with uh, enterprise grade access controls, meaning that if you're working with a team or if you have multiple members, um, there's permissioning and workflow where uh, certain people can be assigned to certain tasks, certain comments can be assigned to certain people, drafts of social media content can be, can be created uh, pending approval, that sort of thing. It has a strong measurement package. Um, it has a, a, a full analytics and reporting package, one-touch executive reporting for just quickly generating uh, reports for uh, users who don't use social media day-to-day. Um, it has social profiling so it can get reports down to even the user. Um, and it allows you to engage with your audience. It has uh, a, uh, commenting features and commenting areas specifically for managing all of your comments across social media in one place. By uh, using the Awareness Social Marketing Hub, it really does allow you to gain control of your, of your social media, centralize it into one manageable area, evolve from tactical and reactionary to strategic, and, um, and produce results, um, and really measure success so that you can make improvements to your social media based on data rather than, you know, based on just uh, based on, on not data. So with that, um, if you're interested in, in seeing how the Social Marketing Hub can help your social media evolve to that really strategic level, um, we do have uh, rather frequent demos. Um, I'll be giving the next demo. It's on March 31st uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, you can uh, register for this via that tiny URL. And after this presentation, what we'll do is I will send out a recording of this presentation um, to all of our attendees. So you will be able to, you know, get this URL in your inbox and register for um, for the Hub demo. And with that, I'm going to um, hand the presentation over to Jason. Very good. Thanks a lot, Sal. And, and uh, just to, to let everyone know, I, I saw the um, the original demo of the Social Marketing Hub about a year ago, uh, maybe a little bit more than a year ago now, and it actually inspired some of the content that you're going to see uh, today uh, in in the presentation that I'm going to take you through because uh, what the Social Marketing Hub does is it puts sort of a dashboard uh, control panel in front of you where you can enter your blog content, but also enter the Facebook and Twitter and Foursquare and YouTube and Flickr content that supports that and promotes that content. So you kind of have an all-in-one shop there, which is a really neat concept. Um, but I think that, that the reason that I wanted to go over this topic with you today, what no one's telling you about your content marketing strategy, is really because if you're given a tool like the Social Marketing Hub, um, you, that's all you've got is a tool. You still have to know how to use the tool and how to use the different channels and how to use the content strategically. So I want to walk you through some ideas today that will hopefully get you down the road of knowing how to approach content strategy from a strategic standpoint, which that's like saying strategy twice in one sentence. I apologize. I am on cold medicine today. I also apologize for a little scratchy voice here. Um, but I want, I want to make sure that people understand that content is not just about your blog, uh, that it's much more diverse than that, and that you have to think about the different channels that you communicate with very differently. And I don't think many people are telling you that. I don't think many people are doing that either. So, We've all heard the phrase, content is king, and so I want to walk you through these ideas today because really content is, uh, to, to sort of borrow uh, a little bit of the terminology a little bit, content is the hub of your activity in the social space. Um, now, that content doesn't have to be a blog. It doesn't have to be videos. It doesn't even have to be what you put on Twitter. Your content can be the conversations that you have with people. Your content can be uh, customer support type content where you're answering questions. So content is all around us. We just need to think a little bit uh, more broadly about it and understand what content is and how we can use it. So I want to walk you through the ideas of approaching content strategically. I'm going to walk you through some questions that you can ask about yourself, about your audiences, and about what you're trying to accomplish with social media marketing that will help you sort of begin to develop a really sound content strategy. I want to talk more, a little bit more today on the call. Uh, I want to dive a little deeper into how the various social channels require different content because I think that's where we're, we're missing uh, in most of our content strategies. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about an example of how uh, you know, one particular piece of content can be distributed around the social web in different ways. I'll show you some examples as well. 
So let's uh, let's dive into this content marketing. First of all, I love Joe Polisi, who's the content marketing institute guy, Gen, uh, Gentle Forty Two, um, and he says that content marketing is about understanding what your customers need to know and delivering it to them in a compelling way. I want you to think about that for just a second, because if you think about the types of content that we've been producing as marketers for the last 50 years, and even though the term content marketing really hasn't come about until the last few years, we've been producing content for a long time. We've been writing speeches. We've been writing press releases. We've been developing newsletters. Um, we've been producing copy for ads and so on and so forth. We've been producing content for a long time as marketers. But up until recently, up until the advent of the social web and the transformation of the consumer to being one that controls their media environment online, we have, we have always written our content about ourselves, about our products and our services. But look at what Joe's saying here, understanding what your customers need to know. They don't need to know about your product necessarily. They might need to know that you have something that can help them solve a problem, but they're more interested in the problem uh, or solving the problem than they are uh, the specific product that you have to solve it. So we have to sort of, again, that social media ethos is, is turning marketing around and focusing on the customer, not the company, not the product or the service. Um, and so when you think about that, what do your customers need? Well, just a little sort of, you know, gut check here for you. Unless you are a supremely outstanding company with a supremely outstanding product, and I can only think of a couple in my mind right now. When you're talking about Apple products, you're talking about supreme, cheap design, good technology, so on and so forth. That's not a bias. That's just a, a marketplace opinion. So unless you are one of those companies, which I'm assuming most of the people on this call are not, then I've got some bad news for you. Your customers don't care about you. They probably don't care much about your products, um, and they probably aren't interested in hearing about you or your products. What you have to do through your content is you have to provide them what they want or what they need, and that's very, very different than what you want and what you need. So the point here is that good content marketing is about the audience. It's about their needs and what they've been doing all these years. It's not about you. So here's the reminder of what we've been doing all these years as marketers. We've been writing opinion pieces for our CEOs or for our companies that go in newspapers uh, or magazines, uh, op-eds. We've been uh, composing newsletters. They might be email newsletters or they might be actually printed newsletters that we circulate to our customers. We've been writing speeches for, for folks. If you're a professional communicator, you've probably had to put together some talking points for an executive before. We've been writing white papers for our companies probably. We've been uh, constructing press releases and media advisories and writing copy for ads and maybe even doing webinars. We've been doing all of this uh, for, for several years. But now social media comes along, and people all of a sudden think of the, the term content marketing, and they get scared, and they think, well, I don't know what that is, and I don't know how to do it. And you've been doing it all along. All social media does is adds channels. It just adds a different set of channels to all of the different uh, venues and, and avenues that you would use in the past to communicate with your customers. So social media adds blogs as a channel. Uh, there's podcasts and videos. Facebook all of a sudden becomes a different channel with a different audience. Twitter is a channel which has a separate audience, LinkedIn the same way. And then you've got other sort of, you know, subsets of those channels like article marketing and, and guest posting, things of that nature, which give you some more opportunities to get out there uh, and, uh, and, and market and promote uh, and, and push your content out in front of a number of people hoping that it meets their needs so that they then turn around and pay attention to you. Now, I want to share with you a few examples of some companies or some uh, some channels where people are doing things the way the social media crowd would say they're doing it wrong. But I want to give you a word on, on a judgment call here. Social media, a lot of social media purists, the ones who, you know, preach about joining the conversation and holding hands around the campfire and singing to by and it's, it's all touchy, feely, warm, and fuzzy, but they don't talk about measurement and they don't talk about uh, what you get out of social media, can you make money doing this? Um, they like to point their finger at people and say, well, here are the rules. This is how you use Twitter, and this is how you use Facebook, and you should never do that on a blog. Well, trust me, there aren't any rules, okay? This is not an environment that's been around long enough for there to be rules defined. 
And this is an environment that is dictated on human behavior, and human behavior will always contradict the rules. So what I want to say before I show you some examples here of some companies that are doing things that are against what I would call best practices with Twitter, Facebook blogs, and whatnot, some of the biggest content marketing mistakes, I don't want you to think that I'm pointing a finger at them and saying they're doing it wrong because if their audience is responding to the way they are pushing content, then they're not doing anything wrong. They're doing everything right. And there's always going to be an audience for it. There's a lot of social media purists out there who will swear up and down that you cannot sell things on Twitter. Well, Dell Allen has sold probably around $8 million of computers through one Twitter channel. That's not through social media. That's not through Twitter, the platform. Through one account, one channel, they've sold the last number, official number I heard was $6.5 million. I'm guessing it's got to be around $8 million now. And so they've proven that there's an audience out there who will subscribe to a Twitter feed for the sole intent and purpose of getting coupons and deals and overstock sales situations. So, yeah, you can sell through Twitter. So there aren't any rules, and none of these folks are wrong. But I want to take you through a couple uh, of examples of what um, I actually have it sort of mislabeled here, what brands do wrong. Uh, here's a couple of examples. Press releases as blogs. You're not seeing as much of this anymore because – I think PR folks are starting to realize. Uh, but the uh, city of Lakeway, Texas there, and to their credit, they don't only post press releases to their blog. So I, I just had to find an example for the graphics. I'm not trying to pick on Lakeway. Um, but this is an example uh, that you see there of a press release that's just been copied and pasted into a blog. Now, there's some benefit there for Lakeway, Texas. They get good search engine optimization value out of having, you know, a press release with some good keywords and whatnot in it. But have you ever tried to read a press release? I mean, if you really want, if you have insomnia, pick up a stack of press releases and start reading. You'll fall asleep in 36 seconds. They're horrible, normally, to read. So putting them out there as blog content really doesn't engage the audience. It doesn't appeal to people who want to read blogs. The other example you see there is of a business uh, that is a, a, a cosmetic dentistry practice in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, and this is an example of someone who takes the RSS feed of their blog and automatically imports it as Facebook posts on their Facebook page, which inherently there's nothing wrong with that. But look at that. That's a, that's a stream. I didn't edit that stream. It's blog post after blog post after blog post. And you see a couple of likes, but you don't see any interaction because there's no interaction from the dentist, from the, from the actual company. They're just automating the feed thinking that that's how you do Facebook. And so there's nothing wrong with automating your blog post to Facebook, but you have to understand that your Facebook audience is different. They need something more than that, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, about that in just a second. Another couple of examples of what brands might be doing wrong or what could be considered wrong is uh, coordinating your tweets and your Facebook posts. So this one uh, example uh, over on the left side of your screen, very simple, is an Italian company, and they automatically import their uh, tweets to their Facebook wall. And so it's just tweet after tweet after tweet after tweet. And that's all that's on their wall. The uh, uh, indie, uh, Home to Indie team, which is a, a real estate uh, agency, does the same thing. Their tweets, which is the, the, the lower uh, right-hand um, graphic there, match their Facebook wall almost, you know, entry for entry. So they're automating the function of tweeting something and it automatically posts to Facebook or vice versa. And I've got a couple of opinions on, on why that's not a best practice. But, again, I don't want to say that the real estate folks in Indianapolis are doing this wrong because they are actually measuring success from doing this, and they're getting business out of it. So who, who am I to say is doing it wrong? If they're satisfied with the results, then there you go. Um, what I would say about uh, automatically posting uh, either your blog posts to your Facebook wall, your blog posts to Twitter, or even your tweets to Facebook or vice versa, is that you have to understand that the people who read your blog, it's a different audience than people who follow you on Facebook. And that's a different audience from people who follow you on Twitter. And so, and, and inherently, just from a 30,000-foot view level, Twitter uh, users differ in how they communicate than Facebook users. It's subtle and it's slight, but they're different communications uh, communities. Um, Twitter is much more informal, short, pithy, conversational. Facebook is much more, I'm just going to click a like button. If I comment, it's going to be almost like a blog comment. It's got to be something that really grabs me. Um, but Facebook is much more about sharing content than Twitter is to a certain degree. 
So you kind of have to understand the mentality of your user on each of these networks to understand what type of content is going to fully engage them. But doing this and automating, you know, Facebook to Twitter, Twitter to blog, so on and so forth, uh, if you think back on how we used to produce content, what those things would be like would be like your CEO has a big speech in front of a room full of people and you give them a press release to read out loud. Or you take your advertising copy and you send that in your monthly newsletter to your newsletter subscribers without adjusting it at all. Or you take an eight-page white paper that you compose for your trade publication and you send that to the newspaper editor as your op-ed piece. You have to match up the communications mechanism with the channel and the audience. You have to make sure that if your CEO is going to give a speech, you have to give the CEO a speech. You don't give him ad copy. And so it's the same thing in the social media world. If you're trying to reach a Facebook audience, you don't reach a Facebook audience with a blog post. If you're trying to reach a blog audience, you don't reach the blog audience with a tweet and vice versa. You have to start thinking about these channels as separate audiences and separate opportunities to deliver sometimes the same message, but it's got to be repurposed. It's got to be polished and repositioned for the people that are out there. So let's talk for a minute about how we would approach a content strategy um, from the beginning. You have to ask yourself a lot of questions. You have to define your audience. And this is not going to be uh, anything uncommon to anyone who's done any sort of marketing or uh, professional communications out there. You've got to define your audience first. Know who you're talking to. You have to define your product and understand exactly what your product is, what it does, where it fits in the marketplace, and how it can solve the problems of the audience. Then you have to define your channels. And it doesn't mean you have to use every channel that's out there, but you have to understand, you know what, maybe your business is better suited sending direct mail pieces than taking out TV ads. Uh, maybe your budget helps define your channels. But you've got to pick the different channels that you're going to use to communicate with people. In the social media space, you're going to want to find out where your audience is online, uh, where are they spending time, and what do they like to share. Uh, so that you can say, you know what, our audience really doesn't hang out on LinkedIn, so we're not going to focus on LinkedIn. And they really don't hang out on Twitter, so we're going to kind of focus on Facebook because that's where our audience tells us they're going. Once you've defined those three things, then you really define your purpose. What do we want to get out of this? And this is another big mistake I think a lot of brands and companies make is they start playing in social media and they never actually take the time to define some goals for what they want to get out of it. Are you trying to sell things? Are you trying to capture leads? Are you trying to build branding and awareness? Uh, you know, figure out what it is you want social media marketing to do, and then you'll have a better time constructing content that will actually achieve something. Um, I like to tell people there are six buckets of what social media can do for a business, and those six buckets very quickly are um, it can en enhance your branding and awareness, it can protect your reputation, it can build uh, community, it can facilitate customer service, facilitate research and development, or the last one is drive sales and leads. So pick one or pick six or pick a combination therein and figure out what you want to get out of this so that when you're starting to sit down and write the content, you know exactly who you're writing for, what you're writing about, how you're communicating to them through the channel, and you ultimately know what you're trying to get out of that communication. Um, there's also the notion in Joe Polizzi, who I mentioned earlier from the Content Marketing Institute, likes to ask people, ask, ask yourself what your content stands for. Um, and when he talks about this, he gives a, a really good example of, of uh, Gary Vaynerchuk with uh, Wine Library TV and how, um, you know, the, his Wine Library TV, the content that sort of made him a household name out there, stood for something. And it didn't stand for selling wine. It stood for making wine accessible. And so you have to sort of define what your content is going to stand for, how you're going to serve your audience, uh, and that will help you obviously better fine-tune your content strategy. So let's dive into some questions about your audience. I'm going to go through these kind of quickly because you'll have access uh, you know, to, these, uh, to these slides and, and the recording here. So I want to make sure that we get uh, enough time for questions. But when you're asking questions about who your audience, ask questions like these. Um, who are they? More specifically, how would I describe my ideal end buyer? You know, make a persona in your mind of who it is that you're trying to sell to because it helps you construct content that's more catered to that person. What are your audience's pain points in relation to your industry or your product or even your service? Uh, or what are their pain points in general? You know, maybe they have some, you know, more broad level frustration that you can help them with. Uh, and so I think that 
Um, like for, I'll give you an example. Um, the, the folks at uh, GoToMeeting at Citrix, uh, they have a blog called Work Shifting, and it's a blog that's focused on sort of the independent practitioner who's working out of Panera Bread or, um, you know, the, the, the home cottage industry person. And, uh, and also professionals who travel a lot. And so work shifting is a blog that really delivers really good value to help solve the pain point of that traveling on the go professional. And it gives them tips like, you know, great steak places in different cities to eat if they're traveling or, you know, here's a, a, an idea on how you can be comfortable on a plane and here's some productivity tips that you can get more done while you're waiting on your, uh, on your plane in the airport. And the, it's, it's really meta level stuff. Um, Ultimately, though, the Citrix folks, the go-to-meeting folks, know that these on-the-go professionals need to have uh, a meeting service, some sort of online, you know, webinar meeting solution. And work shifting solves a general pain point, but then obviously leads them right to the specific pain point that that product or service is going to solve. So, a really good example uh, out there of of someone who is looking at the general pain points of the audience. Some other questions: How can you make them smarter? Uh, the, the more in information and the more intelligence you can give your target audience, the more they're going to like you because you become a trusted resource. Uh, what do your buyers uh, need to know? Uh, what do they need to know about you? What do they need to know about your competitors? What do they need to know about the general landscape of the industry so that you can make them smarter in their purchasing decision? Chris Hewer likes to talk about marketing as it's not about selling me something. It's about helping me buy something. And those are it's a subtle change in language, but it actually is real definitive when you when you look at it. Um, what knowledge will help them do their jobs and what knowledge will help relieve those, those pain points? Again, if you can solve the problems that your audience has, you're going to become a trusted resource for them. Some questions about that audience. What would capture their attention otherwise? What types of content would they find helpful? What fun topics would they respond to? You might want, you might be dead set on making funny viral videos, but if your audience doesn't have much of a sense of humor, then there's no point in doing that. So you need to start asking your audience those questions to figure out exactly what it is that you can produce that will be compelling to them. What types of multimedia would interest or engage them? So those are questions about your audience. Now let's go over some questions about you because this is where you're going to start getting into the nitty-gritty, I think. Um, what content resources do you already have? Do you already do a newsletter? Do you already produce an annual report? Um, do you already, you know, spit out speeches and press releases and corporate videos? Do you already have content that you can somehow reshape or repurpose on the web? What expertise do you have? I like to tell clients pro providing value to an audience in the social media space is much more uh, about sharing your expertise than it is sharing your catalog. I don't care what you have to sell me. I want to know what you have to tell me. I want to know what you, how you can make me smarter, how you can enrich my experience. Because if I like you, I'm probably going to buy from you. But I'm not really interested in what you have to sell. I'm interested in what you have to tell. Um, what tangible items can we share? So maybe you can give away things. Maybe you can uh, you know, give away products or T-shirts or tchotchkes or whatever. But there's some tangible items you can share as well. Who can you interview? And think about this not just from an internal standpoint, because there's probably plenty of people in your company you can interview that would be interesting to other people, but maybe you go to trade shows. And maybe you have contact with other notable names in your industry that you can interview. The social media sphere goes nuts when we go to conferences. We all whip out our flip cams and start interviewing each other because we have direct contact with really smart people at these conferences so that we can come back and put that information on our blog for our audiences. So you can do that as well. Which team members are interesting? Um, I, I just have to pause for a moment and tell this story. There was a gentleman that I used to work with at an advertising agency who was kind of, you know, the, the wily old coot of the building. He'd been around a while. He was an older gentleman, very, very smart. Um, and he was the, the, the one guy that you could go to his office for 30 minutes a week and you always learned something new. And I wanted more than anything on more than one occasion to just start talking to him on camera and chop up the interviews and use that as our content on our blog because – he was that interesting. You've got someone like that in your company more than likely, or you know someone like that, that you can sit down and just sort of get the war stories and get them on tape and put them, uh, or actually on, you know, zeros and ones, uh, and put them up on the, uh, on the Internet. 
And what topics can you have fun with? I mean, that's just, you know, you're always going to want to have fun uh, if you can. I mean, maybe your audience doesn't have much of a sense of humor, uh, but you like to have fun from time to time. So ask yourself what topics are inbounds for having fun with. Some other questions about your company. What results do you want to affect? Think about it. Are you trying to drive people to buy things? Are you trying to drive people to download a white paper, surrender their email address by signing up for webinars, whatever it is? What is it that you want to get out of your content? And then ask yourself some, some more ethereal questions. How do we want our buyer to feel after consuming our content? Do we want them to feel like they need us? Do we want them to feel confident? Do we want them to feel empowered? Uh, do we want them to feel helpless? I hope not, but it's an option, I suppose. Um, so how do you want them to feel? Think about that as you're comp- composing your content. Uh, what action do you want them to take, and what is the value of that action to you? And that's an interesting question, because if you're trying to drive leads, but not necessarily direct sales, so if you don't sell products on your website, but you're trying to drive leads, then you need to come up with a dollar value of what a lead means. If you can do that, then you can answer that question of ROI because 150 people signed up for the webinar. We think that's a, worth a dollar a lead. That's a $150 return on that particular webinar. So if you can put a dollar value on that lead and you can sit down with your CFO and figure out what that means, I think you can probably come up with some pretty good information there. So um, those I went through those questions rather quickly, uh, but I think you sort of get the understanding that you have to do a lot of self-reflection and inquiry here on the front end of your content strategy to know exactly what it is you're going to be doing with your content. Then you've got to pick your channels. And again, this is really more about understanding your audience and where they're playing and what they're doing online than it is understanding about you and what you want to do. You may love Twitter. You may think Twitter is the greatest thing in the whole wide world, but you may have an audience that's stuck on LinkedIn and they're not coming over to Twitter because they think it's stupid. So you can't spend your business time on Twitter. You want to spend your personal time there because you love it. That's great. But from a business standpoint, when you add the word marketing to the term social media, it's about business. It's about driving leads. It's about driving sales. You've got to figure out how to do that. And in, in order to do that, you've got to pick the channels where, where your audience is, fish where the fish are. Um, and you can choose lots of different channels. You can choose the search engines and focus on search engine marketing and making sure that you're ranking well for organic search. You can choose the engagement channels like Facebook video like YouTube. You can go into SlideShare. I mean, there's lots of B2B professionals out there who literally will go to SlideShare and just look for good SlideShare presentations on different topics, and it's become an interesting little business microcosm uh, social network in and of itself. So all of those channels are out there for the taking. As you define those channels, though, think about, you know, all of the different audiences or or the, the audiences on each channel and how they differ from one another. If you're thinking about your blog, you're thinking about something like, Engaging content that would be keyword driven so you can then search results, uh, search results. You want, you want to present clear calls to action so that while people are reading the content, there's, and they see you mention a product or service, there's a link there so that they can go buy it if they want to. Obviously blogs are more lengthy than Facebook or Twitter, so you can be a little bit more involved there. You can use videos on a blog, you can use audio on a blog, so on and so forth. Facebook is a little different. It's conversational. It's much more short, pithy posts, sharing links. But more importantly than anything else, when you think about your Facebook content, you need to make your Facebook content action-inducing. Every time a person clicks the like button, every time a person comments on something that you put on your page, that then shows up in the news streams of all of their friends, which is what makes Facebook so powerful. It is built to be a viral network. And so when people take an action, when they make a social gesture around the content that you place on Facebook, then your branding and awareness gets spread to their networks. So it behooves you to make Facebook content really compelling to take action. Do you like this? Ask questions so that they have to answer them. Maybe get an application that allows you to do a poll so that they can click a button and participate, and then it automatically shows up that they participated on their friends' news streams. It's all about inducing the action on Facebook to help spread uh, the, the good word about what you're doing there. Twitter is a little different. Uh, obviously, for someone to share what you're doing on Twitter, they can just hit the retweet button, but it's not the same as Facebook. It's not the same as, I like this. 
When you hit the retweet button, you think that that little conversational message is really pithy, it's really funny, it's really informative, or the link to that content is really strong. So it's a slight differentiation in how you attack the content there, but at the same time, you have to understand that there's a different audience there. LinkedIn is much more serious. It's much more of a share-centric uh, network in terms of the status updates, dropping links and things of that nature. People are almost all business on LinkedIn. Uh, you're not going to go over there and have a conversation about hair bands. As, as much as you might want to, it's probably not going to happen. So make sure that you're keeping your content for LinkedIn more focused on being business-centric. And I'll give you an example on the next uh, slide on how you can do that uh, in an interesting way. YouTube, obviously, is video-driven. Your videos need to be short. They need to be entertaining. And they need to be really, really, again, kind of like Facebook action-inducing. You want people to give them a thumbs up. You want people to comment. You want people to add them to their lists and share and all that good stuff. White papers, to use another example of a piece of content, obviously have to be very info-driven. White papers are normally backed up by research. Uh, people who are going to download a PDF of a white paper and read it are people who are really serious about the subject matter. So the content there has to be different. Same thing for a webinar, same thing for um, the speeches you write, so on and so forth. You have to understand not just the message that you're trying to send, not just the goal that you want to get out of the communication, but you have to understand the audience that's going to be receiving the message and the channel in which that message is going to travel. And if you define that for all of the different channels you have and all of the different pieces of content that you have out there, you're going to have much more success with your content marketing. All right, let's jump into an example. Uh, I picked this one because um, it, I'm doing the webinar and I had autonomy over picking it, so just sue me if you don't like the example. But let's say you're a performing arts center, uh, and let's say that you've got Eric Clapton coming in concert, and you're getting ready to announce this. So here's how I might attack um, uh, how to disseminate content and some ideas on content that I would put out there about this particular uh, piece coming up. So if, if I have a blog, I'm obviously going to blog about the event and tell people that Eric Clapton's coming to town. I'm going to schedule a couple of ticket sales reminders throughout the three, four, five weeks leading up to it. But I might also go around and ask staff members what their uh, personal memories of Eric Clapton's music are. You know, when did they first hear Layla or something of that nature? And put together some sort of inside my organization, you know, meaty, you know, feature type context around Eric Clapton and his career. I might find a local guest blogger who would want to review his latest album or movie or whatever it is he's promoting. Um, I might go to previous tour stops. Uh, on Clapton's concert tour and pull together reviews from other blogs and, and, and YouTube videos and whatnot and aggregate, the, aggregate, aggregate, if I can speak correctly today, aggregate those on my blog so that they're there. Um, I might ask the audience to post YouTube videos picking their favorite Eric Clapton song and why or maybe uh, and, then, and then pick the best ones and, and repost those on the blog so that I'm driving consistent blog content reminding people that Eric Clapton is coming but not selling tickets every single time. You know, obviously you can have links to buy tickets in each post, but the theme of each post is different and it's featurey and it's fun. Um, if I'm on Facebook, um, then I'm going to, obviously I'm going to link to my blog posts, but I'm not just going to automate those links in. I'm going to post, hey, we just posted uh, an interesting um, perspective on Eric Clapton's music from our, you know, production manager uh, on this video on our blog. Here's the link to the blog. But we want to ask all of you on Facebook, you know, what's your favorite memory of Eric Clapton? When did you fir first hear uh, Layla, or did you like the movie Crossroads, or whatever. Um, I might do a poll about the, the favorite Eric Clapton bands, since he was in so many bands, Cream and Eric and the Dominoes. And so I might say, well, which is your favorite, you know, rendition of his career? Which, which band do you like most that he played with? I might ask fans to post their own Play Like Clapton video clips, so have them play an air guitar or something of that nature, and maybe give away tickets. Ask trivia questions on your Facebook wall post. Anything to incite or induce an activity on Facebook is going to help virally spread what you're doing. On Twitter, I would ask open-ended questions with my audience there about Clapton's favorite albums, favorite bands, memories of his live performances. Um, I would post links to the favorite band, fan videos that I have from that, that YouTube, you know, Clapton performance idea. I would post, hey, here's somebody posted a video on our Clapton contest. It doesn't directly sell tickets, but it leads people into this conversation about Eric Clapton coming to town. And, oh, by the way, I need to go to that show. Where do I buy tickets? Well, here's all these links. So there you have it. 
Um, I would point the Twitter fans to the Facebook polls. You can't really do a poll very easily on Twitter, but you can certainly link to it from Twitter to Facebook and say, hey, come over and join us on Facebook. We've got a poll going on you may want to uh, participate in. I might even use LinkedIn, and here's how I might use LinkedIn. I might go into the local uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, chat board or, or group uh, and remind people there of the corporate entertainment options around the event, that you have luxury boxes or you have you know, a chance for dinner with Eric Clapton or something of that nature for corporate sponsors, and make sure you're communicating with that audience around the event as well. Obviously, I've mentioned some videos, so you can use YouTube as the submission point for fan videos, uh, contest videos that you might uh, pull together, uh, or you might actually go around YouTube and pull together a playlist of really good live performances from Clapton throughout the years and embed the playlist on your blog, but then also you're serving the YouTube community as well. So just a, a set of ideas there on what you, how you might take one piece of content, the fact that Eric Clapton's coming to play in concert, and divide that up among different channels and different networks and reposition that content and roll content ideas, creative ideas, off of that one piece of content so that you can make a big splash with that particular um, event. So anchor your content strategy. We've, we've gone through all these questions and all this good stuff. Let's, let's bring it home with four salient points here. You are the media. You have to think like media now. You are a brand journalist. And so you have to run your marketing department uh, like you're running a newsroom. You're the editor of your own magazine or your own television station or your own combination of magazine and television station, and it's all online. So you've got to think through an editorial calendar, which makes planning and organization simple. Look at the, the scope of what you've got to do over the course of six months to a year and start planning. Okay, we're going to have this announcement here. We need 20 pieces of content around this announcement. We need features. We need videos. We need pictures. So plan that ahead of time so that you have plenty of content to roll out there to your audience. Always keeping in mind, of course, that you're there to serve the audience's needs, not just promote your stuff. People don't care what you have to sell. They care what you have to tell. Social participation is still going to be a requisite here. You can't just push content out to these social networks and not interact with people on those social networks. Remember the cosmetic dentist example I showed you. It was post after post after post with no interaction from the brand. When you do that, you're automating, and automating is not human. Automated, by definition, is something that's handled by a machine or some sort of automatic process. If you're human, you're interesting. If you're automatic, you're not, and people aren't going to watch you. And then the last thing I would throw out there is keyword research always helps because you can never um, do enough to try to win search results for the different keywords and whatnot that you're trying to win because search will always be, in my opinion, uh, one of the most important things that a digital marketer can do. So that takes us through uh, what people aren't telling you about your content strategy. Uh, essentially, the, the overall point is, is that you really need to think about content strategically. You really need to think about each channel as a different audience and make sure that the content that you are producing is customized to the channel and to the audience. Does this make your work harder? Yes, it does. Uh, maybe not harder, just more time intensive. Uh, so it complicates things for you a little bit. But the more specific you can be, the more relevant information that you can deliver to a relevant audience at a relevant time, the better your results are going to be. Here's where you can find me online, and, and because you uh, were patient enough to sit through my gravelly voice today, um, I want you to look at, if you're interested in exploring social media, which is a learning community, a subscription-based learning community that I run, um, it's really geared toward the... Uh, 201, 301 crowd, we've got a lot of hand-holding content there, but we also have some pretty deep dive strategic content, including uh, a content strategy piece uh, that kind of parallels the content we talked about today. If you'd like to try exploringsocialmedia.com, if you go and register, use the uh, coupon code JASON, JASON, which is there at the bottom of your screen, uh, and you'll get a month for free. Please don't share that on Twitter. I don't want everybody in the world getting a free month, but just for you guys here on the awareness uh, webinar. I would love for you guys to come try exploring social media. And with that, I'm going to turn everything back over to uh, Sal, and uh, we'll start taking some questions, I think. Yep, um, I'm going to run through just a couple more uh, sort of housekeeping, housekeeping items, and then we'll get right to the questions. So, give me one second. 
Um, so, uh, if everyone on the line enjoyed today's session, well, just a couple of uh, options on what you can do now. Um, basically, uh, let's, let's stay in contact. Um, follow uh, awareness on Facebook. Uh, our Facebook group is called uh, Social Media Marketing Best Practices, and you know we present you know our our research, our information. We try to aggregate all the information from all over the web. We're trying to keep uh, everybody informed of what's going on in the social space. Um, follow us on Twitter at uh, Awareness Inc. And you can also visit our, our, our blogs at awarenessnetworks.com in the community area. And um, if you enjoyed uh, today's webinar, just to let you know, we have uh, an ongoing series of webinars. Uh, the next one is called 30 Minute Social Media Marketing um, with Susan Ganelius, author and president, uh, excuse me, uh, CEO and president of uh, Key Splash Creative. Um, that's on April 7th at 2 p.m. So that's another free webinar. Um, so let's get to the questions. So I have a couple questions here, and uh, as we go through reading through these, we'll just let the audience know. You can continue to submit them. Uh, submit them via Twitter at Pound Awareness Inc. You can also submit them via the WebEx Q&A. Um, uh, but, Jason, the first question that I'll start with is uh, something that came in via the Q&A. Um, just sort of a concern about blogs and websites uh, decreasing in importance as a result of mobile and of Facebook. Uh, do you see that? sort of happening? Is it going to happen? Is it happening now? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that the uh, I think that the key here is not necessarily that blogs are decreasing in importance. I think they're still very important. Um, I just think that the influx of, of, of users, I mean, think about Facebook's growth over the last, you know, two years. It's grown by two or three hundred million people. And so I think you're seeing, obviously, a, a peak uh, in, in people you know, going to Facebook first, but I think ultimately people are finding that Facebook is not a substantive experience if they're looking for you know, more information about products and services or certain topics. I think that's when uh, you know, people will turn to Google and start you know, searching for uh, different types of content. What I will say, though, is I think that websites and blogs out there uh, that are not, or companies that have websites and blogs out there that are not building mobile-friendly versions of their websites or of their blogs are hurting themselves because, um, I mean, I know when I'm on my iPhone and I want to go look at something on someone else's blog, if I have to blow the screen up real big to be able to see it because it doesn't have a mobile uh, theme, uh, it's, it's really frustrating. And so I just assume not go to that website or that blog. So I don't think it's Facebook that's really killing uh, people going to blogs, I think it's blogs and websites not keeping up with the times and making sure that there's a mobile version there. Um, I don't see blogs ever becoming, you know, not important in, in a marketing strategy, at least not in the next five to ten years, because they are absolutely fantastic magnets for search engine results. And if you think about that, if you, if you don't have an appreciation for what search can do for you, Understand that when you rank in the top three or four positions for a keyword in Google, then what that means is, is is the visitors who are coming to that page are primed and ready to have their problem solved. They are searching for a solution. And if you are one of the top three or four people that can offer that solution, and blogs are really the most powerful way that you can rank organically if you have a really good blog that drives a lot of inbound links and so on and so forth, you can rank real well for keywords. Um, if you win those one of those top three or four slots, you have a really good chance of solving that customer's problem and becoming someone that they want to buy from. You know, yeah, that's that's interesting with the um, sort of blogs and, and and SEO. And I know there's sort of a there's sort of tug of war there because um, you know you want to write your blog, and you know one of the main points of your presentation is make this interesting, make make your content useful to your audience. Um, but you also have to have sort of an SEO mind when you're writing your blog, to, I find anyway, to really be effective. You can go out there and write, uh, you know, write interesting blog topics and, and posts and things like that. But um, I think it is really helpful to go back maybe when you're done writing it and say, okay, how can I make this more SEO friendly? I mean, I think that's, a, that's just a really smart way to sort of write your blog and make sure that it's both, both useful and it's found in the right place. Um, so uh, one question that came in was you, you're talking about sort of thinking about like a publisher. Are there any uh, specific tools that you use or recommend for sort of keeping track of your publishing calendar? Um, you know, there's, a, there's actually a couple of really interesting tools out there that I've seen recently. One of them is called Kapost, K-A-P-O-S-T. I think it's K-A-P-O-S-T. 
kosd.com, just kapost.com. Um, and it's a, um, basically a, a blog editorial management system where you can uh, not only manage your blog and the content there, but manage multiple authors. I think they even have a, a mechanism where you can bring in, you know, uh, freelancers that you have to pay, and you can actually pay them through the system and everything, which is, I think, you know, pretty uh, pretty cool. Um, I've also seen some blog platforms like Engage, uh, which do a really good job of, of, of managing multiple author blogs. Uh, so that you can sort of treat your company website like a newsroom and have assignments and calendars and whatnot that are all built into it. Um, I don't think there's any uh, other than those two. I don't. I've not seen anything that's really you know this cool magical solution that isn't some sort of complicated media planning software package that's going to cost too much money. Um, but to, to be quite honest with you, I've got uh, 13 authors uh, that contribute to Social Media Explorer, uh, not including myself, and we set up a spreadsheet. In, uh, in Google Docs and share it, and everybody you know has their name on a specific day, and you go in and you plug in your you know the topic that you want to tackle, and I go through and sort of offer some uh, suggestions and notes and whatnot, and we manage it pretty simply there, and that's a blog that has 14 authors. So um, sometimes Google Docs and the, the simple you know solution is the best. Hmm. Um, I have a couple questions coming in here. I'm going to try to sort of aggregate them into one. I guess really what a lot of what the audience is asking is, you know, how do you actually go for that sale or go for that conversion? So, you know, you're posting out there, you're, you're trying to be relevant, you're trying to be informative, you're trying to be helpful. Um, but at a certain point, you know, I know that you did mention making sure that you have links to, to purchase and things like that. But so, you know, at, at what point or what's the best way to go about sort of uh, at some point making the hard sell? Sure. Well, first of all, make your calls to action obvious. So, you know, if you're, let's say that you are a, um, a card, uh, uh, let's say you sell, you sell tires, okay? Uh, and so when you go to your blog or you go to your Facebook page or whatnot, make sure that you've got a big call to action banner over there on the side somewhere that says, buy tires here, you know, or whatever, something real obvious. So you, you use advertising, uh, your own advertising, to draw people to, to a call to action. You can also put those call to a- calls to action, the graphic type calls to action, right in the middle of your, your posts and things of that nature. But as you're writing your content, when you mention the, um, you know, Uter Royal Grade A Radial Snow Tire, link that language to a place on your website where they can buy that snow tire. Um, and it doesn't have to be uh, outwardly selling in order for you to be successful in presenting a reasonable call to action for someone to buy something. One of my favorite blogging success stories is Wiggly Wigglers, which is a sort of a herb and organic, you know, seeds gardening sort of place in the United Kingdom. And in their blog posts, they'll say, well, we're, we're going to give you three or four uh, different ideas on how you can build your own bird feeder for the backyard. And if you don't want to build your own bird feeder, well, here's a link to a kit where you can order from us and, and, and the kit's a little bit easier to use. I mean, it's just really friendly, conversational. They're selling you something, and they're not being, you know, they're not being sneaky about it. They're just saying, well, if you want to buy it, we've got one, but here's how you can do it yourself if you want to. And so sometimes it's just, it, it's just making sure that you're being conversational and, and not, you know, being too pushy with the sale, uh, but making the sale easy and obvious for the person you're communicating with. The other thing I would lay on top of that is if you are consistently there, if you're consistently in the middle of a conversation with people uh, over the course of time, people become really familiar with you. They become they come to trust you, and so you don't have to hard sell. When they're ready to buy snow tires, they know who to come to. So I want to go back to actually early on in the presentation. You mentioned Dow as an example. Um, do you want to sort of go over you know, what you like about that? Um, one concern uh, that came up. Uh, and maybe you can sort of chime in on your opinion on that, is the concern that, you know, Dell's success on Twitter would cannibalize other sort of outlets. Um, but sort of what do you like about that example? What do they do right? And what do you think about that concern? Okay. What I really like about the Dell example is is that, and, and this is this is critical, Dell outlet would not have worked if there had not been other Dell accounts on Twitter. They would, they, they, I don't think they would have been able to genuinely come to a conversational slash social media audience and said, we built a channel, and we're just going to drop coupons and, and links to deals on it. I think everybody would have been like, yeah, whatever, go away. But because they had people like um, Richard Benhammer and Lionel Menchaca and, and Chris and John and all of the at Dell you know, Twitter accounts, 
that were sort of customer service folks who had been on Twitter for a while laying the foundation for the company to participate in the conversation, as it were. Um, then they said, you know what, we get requests from people all the time on, hey, where can we get good deals on hardware and blah, blah, blah. Well, we've opened up this Twitter account. If you follow it, it's a sales-only channel. We're not necessarily going to sit here and chit-chat with you from Dell Outlet because we've got other avenues where you can find us. Um, that's what made it work, I think. I don't think it would have worked as – it probably would have worked, but I don't think it would have worked as well or been as successful had they not laid that foundation first. And, and I don't see a Twitter channel – uh, for any company cannibalizing either any other company's uh, ability to sell or other channels of your own company in order to sell. Uh, you know, it's, it's saying that the, the Dell Outlet Twitter channel cannibalizes their sales on their website is like saying, um, you know, the Apple store in Louisville, Kentucky cannibalizes people who want to buy apples in Lexington, Kentucky. I don't think it does at all. You're still selling to the same audience. Great. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, being uh, we're aware that you know, we work with a lot of companies, and we find that that's definitely a trend that's increasing, and it is really effective. Just you know, multiple channels, Twitter, Facebook, or, you know, usually the most common ones. We have multiple Twitter channels, multiple uh, Facebook uh, fan pages, you know, for the same company, just based on one individual thing. We do that a little bit here with awareness, with you know, sort of our uh, you know customer service team versus our our social marketing team, things like that, and. Um, I know a lot of people on the line right now are, are just getting started, and maybe they just want to get their first one up and running, but that's something that I think is going to, you know, continue to be more and more common. It's just, uh, you know, exactly that bell, that bell is the echo. Um, one really good question that just came in, actually, uh, from Ann on the, um, from Ann on the, uh, WebEx chat is, how do you find out which channel your audience is in? I know at the beginning of your presentation you sort of mentioned, uh, if your audience is not in a channel, even if you like it, probably something to be ignored. So, you know, what would you recommend is how to find out which channel? Are we still there? Nope. I'm going to assume we are. I'm going to answer the question. Um, there are a couple of tools out there that you can use to um, uh, find out, you know, where your audience is. Um, unfortunately, one of them uh, recently just uh, – um, Shifted, they were, I think they were, they've shifted their focus. It was called Flowtown, F-L-O-W-T-O-W-N. I think you can still use it, but I think it's somewhat limited in uploading an email database of your customers, uh, and then being able to, um, and then being able to, um, see what channels that they're on. Um, there's also GIST, uh, G-I-S-T dot com, uh, which, uh, allows the same type of thing. Um, and uh, you can upload your email list to GIST, and it will sort of go out and find uh, accounts, uh, email accounts that are connected to that particular um, to that particular email address. So you'll be able to see oh, a certain percentage of my customers are on Facebook versus Twitter. But I think really the the, the best answer is to just ask them. I mean, you've got customers. Um, you know, send a little survey in the email, or as they come into your store, ask them how they what they do online, how they do things online. Um, and uh, that will probably uh, solve your problem. So I believe um, uh, I might be the only one talking here. I think Sal, maybe we lost him. Oh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we had a little... I, heard, I heard an awkward click, and I didn't know if I was still on or not. <laughs> nope, you're, you're on. Sorry, we were off, but now we're back. Um, I think that's all we have time for. Back to Jason, before you go, I want to hand you the ball. Just because um, she didn't work with the presenter. Someone asked if you could uh, go the six goals of what social media can do. If you could just bring that up and just show them that slide again before we go. Oh, okay. And I don't think I had it on a slide, actually. Okay. Um, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I will go into the chat right now, and I will send a, ch a, a message to all attendees. And here we go. My, my typing finger's a little stiff here, but uh, we'll see. Uh, the first thing is uh, that it can uh, enhance your branding and awareness. And awareness. I should know how to spell that since I'm on the awareness seminar. <laughs> All right. Uh, the second thing is it can protect your reputation. And hopefully everybody is seeing these. Reputation. Uh, the third thing is it can build community or loyalty around your brand. I'm not going to take responsibility for correct spelling here. Uh, enhanced customer service is number four. Number five is facilitate or enhance uh, research and development. So kind of like your Dell Ideas Forum kind of things. 
where you get product information or market research from your audience. And the sixth thing is the golden cow, driving sales or leads. And so those are the six big buckets of what social media marketing can do for your company. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I think we're ending now, so we're able to actually pass time. And uh, thank you for everyone for attending. Thank you, Jason, for presenting, and we'll see you all again real soon. Bye, guys.